This is a production of Cornell University. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my thesis project. Uh, I just defended last week, so everything is in motion. Um, I passed, so now you can hear about my thank you. So, um, first, I want to start with just a picture of my home. This is uh, actually 20 minutes from Amarillo, but it's called Paladura Canyon. It's the second largest canyon in the United States behind the Grand Canyon. And um, as you can see, this is a pretty different climate from Ithaca, New York. So whenever I came here, it was a, quite a culture shock. But um, I didn't realize that I lived in a desert climate whenever I was growing up because this was my home. Um, and it's beautiful and diverse and rocky and so, so windy. Um, so when I came to Cornell, um, I came with a lot of experience that was maybe a little not traditional. So as I said, I was born and raised in the Texas Panhandle. And uh, the year before I started here at Cornell, I became a beekeeper working at a local apiary. I um, learned everything from this family that decided to teach me everything they knew. And um, that really helped me just ignite my passion about ecology and agriculture and seeing how important honeybees are um, made me start thinking a little more about some more dynamic relationships. And I'm specifically really excited about pollinator interactions with plants. So I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about that today. But, but this is basically a, a video of me um, scraping the wax covering off of a honey frame. And this is all honey. And at the apiary, you take these little quote, super frames full of capped honey that the bees have collected and made. And then you put it in this kind of giant centrifuge thing and it whacks all the honey out to the side. Um, so this was just a view of what I was doing before I got here. But I'll tell you a little more about what I've been up to while I've been here. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So anyway, that's pretty cool. That's what I did for months and months. We have lots and lots of money. Um, so, OK. So I want to start just briefly about um, a little bit about strawberry pollination. Um, I specifically worked on the day neutral strawberry Albion. And so all of the images that I have are Albion. Um, this is a cross section of the strawberry flower. And strawberries are perfect flowers, specifically Albion. And they have male and female gametes on the same flower. So whenever you add wind to the equation, you can have really nice self-pollination. And there's different capacities to self-pollinate based on um, cultivar. But Albion specifically was bred to have pretty high self-compatibility. So um, without a lot of insect intervention, there can be nice set fruit. However, if you add insects into the equations, you can also have greater fruit set, uniform fruit appearance, and greater commercial value. This is because uh, the true fruit of the strawberry are the achenes, which are these little green seeds you can see right here. And whenever they're fertilized, they begin to secrete auxins into the receptacle, which is about right here. And that's what enlargens into the red fleshy part of the strawberry fruit. So as you can imagine, if you have a higher percentage of these achenes fertilized, you're going to have more uniform auxin secretion, which will yield a nicer shaped, better set fruit. So insects could potentially really be helpful in strawberry pollination. I also briefly want to talk about the difference between honeybees and native bees. Honeybees are only one type of bee, and they are pretty widely um, regarded as a really efficient pollinator in agricultural systems. But as we continue to learn more about pollinator interactions, we're finding out that they're not the only player that's important here. So honeybees are eusocial, meaning that they live in a colony with cooperative shared care of the brood. They have one reproductively active female, and um, they're often domesticated, meaning they need somebody to manage their hive in order to have really high productivity. Native bees are kind of a different story. They are mostly solitary, meaning that one female builds her nest and cares for her own brood. This is pretty common in most other animal kingdom situations. Uh, but one really important thing here is that they are wild and very difficult to domesticate. As you can imagine, if you're managing thousands of individual females and individual nests with only a few brood per cell, um, it can be really challenging to make sure that health is good and that the females are performing how they should. And so bolstering wild populations here may be the best way to go about this. 
So for my thesis, I had a few research aims. I wanted to learn how to best grow day neutral strawberries, specifically Albion, in New York State by focusing on propagule manipulation and intero vegetation. And I also wanted to discover what pollinators can or cannot provide for strawberry in New York State. So I'll go into my experimental design a little bit. Um, so we planted Albion in uh, annual plastic culture. We did two replications. So we replanted each year in this white plastic. And this is kind of what the field looked like the first year. And we used a split plot RCVD. So everything was completely randomized. And this is kind of uh, a visual of how we randomized some of our nested treatments. So we started with uh, three inter-row cover treatments at the whole plot level, which would be these kind of wide green, white, or uh, blue, pink blocks. And um, they all have different qualities of vegetative growth, including exclusion netting tunnels, which are these white tunnels. Um, they were low tunnels with really fine mesh netting to exclude any insect activity. Then we had a flowering cover that was in between the rows of the plastic. And then we had a bare ground cover that was either mowed very, very short to have basically no flowering, or we had um, cultivation, so it was completely bare soil. And then within these treatments, we had four propule types at the subplot level, and we had um, different developmental cycles that we staggered. So our control plants were dormant bare root crowns that we planted in the field uh, around May each year. We had two types of early start plants. Those were dormant bare root crowns that we started um, one month and two months before the infield planting date in the greenhouse to establish as transplants. And then we had plug plants, which were daughter plants from previous mother plants that we pinned in the greenhouse and then created transplants that went to the field the fall prior to the harvest season. So here's a closer look at what these looked like uh, on May 6, 2022, which was the first infield planting date for the first replicate. The berries have really no vegetative growth. Um, the early starts have varying amounts of uh, vegetative growth here. And then the plug plants are pretty well established um, and they were planted in August the previous year or um, October for the next replication. So um, I broke this up into two different types of experiments. We're going to talk about the propagule type experiments first, and then we'll cover the intro flowering covers for a uh, second. So the first hypothesis was that different propagule types will flower and fruit in different patterns. And this ideally will lead to a more consistent supply of fruit during the season. If anybody's familiar with uh, strawberry production in New York State currently, a lot of growers grow June bearing strawberries, which usually have a huge flush of fruit in June, and then not really any availability after that. So to have day neutrals, which have the capacity to fruit continuously as long as the environment is um, desirable, could really expand the season for New York growers. And uh, we also predict that plants started earlier will be more productive throughout the season, likely due to limited sink source uh, competition. So I'm going to start with um, our total yields for 2022 and 2023. These are mean over the months. So the months are at the bottom here. This is 2022, this is 2023. And then we have mass and grams here um, along the side. And I just like to note the scaling difference here. This goes up to a little over 600 grams, and this goes to about 500 here. Um, and we do have a little bit different fruiting cycles, though. One thing I would like to point out is that 2023 was a really challenging growing year, um, simply because of the amount of precipitation we had. And precipitation, mm -hmm. as you know, can uh, lead to a lot of increased fungal, bacterial, any kind of disease problems. And so we had decreased yields uh, in general, but that also really compromised our marketable yields. Um, you can also see that it seems that we're having really high peaks. Uh, the purple is the plug type propagules around August or um, a little bit earlier. So the plugs really are performing really well in these types of environments. And then the early starts seem to do okay um, the red line is the bare root propagules, and it's pretty stark how different their performance is compared to these other types of propagules. 
So I'd like to move on to marketable yield. This is in 2022. I have these separated by um, cover. So we have the bare ground cover, exclusion, and flowering cover. And then on the side is mean uh, mass, marketable mass. And really the main story here is that exclusion cover plugs and sometimes early starts really perform significantly better than um, the bare root plants here, which performed a lot worse. And um, we predict that this is because there was less sink source competition and also because the establishment planting date and um, transplants allowed for maybe some quicker root establishment. You have leaves to provide better photosynthate um, compared to no vegetative or active root growth. So for 2023, um, our yields are much, much lower. Um, as you can see, we barely had any marketable yield in some of these covers, but really the consistent relationship here is that plugs and exclusion are doing significantly better than other crop yield types and other uh, interrow cover types. Um, I'd also like to point out that I looked at the NUA data for uh, the two years, and we looked from the start of harvest to the end of harvest for both of years. And for 38% of 2022, we had what was considered a rainy day, which was any amount of precipitation. Um, that's compared to 57% of the 2023 season, just to show you how much more rain we were having. And so this climate variability can really compromise our marketable yields. Um, next, I wanna talk a little bit about marketable fruit size by Profigule. Here is 2022 and here is 2023. So again, they're separated into these cover types. And um, while there are some significant differences, uh, the fruit size is really stable around uh, 10 grams, uh, anywhere up to, I would say 12 to 13 grams, which is a really nice sized berry. It's often about that big, maybe the size of like a small cookie. Um, but it's really nice to see that no matter what's going on here, we have really nice uh, formed fruit. Okay. Uh, another thing we wanted to look at was season length, especially with cycling these different propagules to see if we could have a longer harvest period. And in uh, 2022 and 2023, we looked at season length based on marketable yields greater than 100 grams per subplot. Each subplot was about 16 plants. And if we're saying that fruits were about 10 grams each, this would only be 10 fruit per subplot, which is a pretty low threshold to say that we should pick these fruits. Um, but I think this is a really nice example of what weather can do to a season. Um, in exclusion, we had really nice performance, though um, the other propagules maybe didn't do so well the next year. However, in bare ground and flowering, even when the weather was pretty desirable, we had under two weeks of that amount of marketable yield, which is pretty low. And when you have really, really bad weather conditions, you can see we hardly had not even a week uh, worth of picking um, and had a lot of disease and pest problems. So um, I think the story here would be to say that growing strawberries in New York without any sort of protective covering or intensive pest management is not a great idea. And having some sort of covering this exclusion netting or low tunnels can really improve marketable yields um, is the best thing to do here in New York State. Okay, well, again, what, what was the flowering? Sure, um, yeah, the flowering cover, um, it, I actually have it on this next slide. Oh, well, um, kind of, there we go. Yeah, so I'll just cover these quickly and then I'll, I have this picture of the flowering cover that I'll explain. Um, in terms of our interro cover, which I mentioned briefly and I'm gonna talk about more now, um, we hypothesized that the strawberry pollinator guild is going to change over the season and it won't be the same uh, visitors each time. And that the yield and fruit set in Albion are improved when adjacent floral awards are available. So in 2022, we seeded sweet alyssum. In 2023, we seeded white clover. And these were to complement the native flowers that were coming up as well. So this was considered the flowering cover. Um, this is a picture from 2023 of native German chamomile coming up in between the rows. Um, but we also seeded these other plants as a sort of um, attractive pollinator flower to potentially attract different things that maybe weren't going to be foraging on these native plants. 
And we also didn't know the pollen quality or nectar quantity that these plants were providing. So we thought by supplementing, that may lead to a more um, even pollinator attractive environment. So um, next, I want to talk a little bit about bees on strawberry. For 2022, it was a little bit of a dry season. And um, I'm going to go through this graph kind of slowly because there's a lot going on here. We broke these up into two different types of cover because our exclusion cover, we're assuming have zero insect interaction because there's a net, there should be zero visitation. So there are no visitations recorded on those plots. So the not flowering would be the bare ground with no flower available in between the rows. The flowering would be uh, the seeded alyssum or clover and native plants in between the rows. And um, the bottom here is the date of visitation and then the visitations are on the side here. Um, and visitations had to be recorded in a very specific way. I tried to do weekly, but you have to have perfect weather conditions to have nice pollinator visitation. So that meant barely went, barely any wind, hardly any clouds, sunny, um, good air quality, which was another challenge we had in 2023 that we didn't have in 2022 due to the wildfires. Um, and the visitation counted if any part of the bee made landing contact with any reproductive part of the flower. Um, which would signify some sort of pollen transfer. So here, uh, the black line in both of these graphs is Apis mellifera, or the European honeybee, which is right here. And I also incur uh, included this picture to show kind of how large the honeybee is in relation to the strawberry flower. And um, honeybees carry their pollen on scopa on their back legs. And if you're looking at this picture, besides the static that's holding pollen onto their fur on their thorax, you're missing a lot of pollen that's hanging off the back of the flower. And so really, if you didn't have a lot of honeybee visitations, they're not uh, morphologically very well suited for strawberry pollination. It's kind of hilarious to watch them <laughs> try to figure out how to deal with those things. However, we have some other bees that are much more well suited and in higher frequency um, in strawberry, like Helictus confusus, which is this kind of purple line in both graphs that peaks usually around July and kind of um, the beginning of August. This is a really nice early season pollinator that we observed pretty consistently. Additionally, Lazioglossum is this kind of small black uh, bee. They are very, very tiny. You can see it's curled around this one um, structure on the strawberry flower. And they often have a crawling foraging habit. So they'll crawl along all of the pistils and all over the flower, which will drag pollen all over the uh, all over the female parts of the flower. And that's this pink line. So they're pretty consistent throughout most of the season, but especially in the late season, they seem to be the primary pollinators. And then uh, towards later season, we have Agua Chlorella, which is this kind of shiny green race car bee. Um, that's pretty small. They're primitively used social, so they form really, really small hives. And um, they're observed in pretty good quantities towards the end of the season. Um, so for 2023, we saw a similar sort of story. Um, however, I had one honeybee visitation on the very last day that I was recording observations. And while I observed honeybees on the interrow flower, jumping over onto strawberries was not a very common phenomenon. Um, I would say hardly never when I was doing my observations, except for this one time at the end of September. Um, however, we had Helictus confusus is the purple again around the same time that it was present in um, 2022, this purple line. And then we had Lazioglossum, which was present for majority of the season in both of these uh, plots. And then what really surprised me was we had a really large boom in uh, bum bumblebees, Bombus and Patience, which is kind of a common bumblebee around this area um, that was really, really present in the late season. And then Agoflorella and a kind of similar uh, relationship here. We, I was talking to um, Brian Danforth in the entomology department about why we saw bumblebees here and not last um, in the 2022 season. 
And 2022 is pretty dry early in the season. Um, and that's when bumblebees are establishing their nests. And so if you have really poor vegetative availability and water, you're not going to have very many bumblebee queens establish. However, in 2023, we had a really wet year, which is very lush. There's lots of water, there's lots of resources. And so we theorize that maybe this productivity here is because we had a lot more bumblebee hives established around the site in East Ithaca that could lead to this increase in um, activity. So that's another thing to say that weather is a huge um, factor in these sorts of systems and de uh, determining what is going on in terms of pollinators. So I also collected specimens in 2022 and 2023 for, uh, by sweep netting. So every two weeks I would go and collect anything that was observed on the strawberry flower itself. And um, these tell a pretty similar story to the visual observations with Polyptus confusus comprising 44% of my collection. Um, that would be these bees right here. And then Agoplorella orata doing about 18%. Um, that would be these bees here. And then um, the Apis mellifera or the European honeybee, I only collected two of in 2022, and that's this kind of small orange slice. So this is really nice to show what percentage of the pollinator guild honeybees are comprising. And maybe it's not an awesome idea to rely on honeybees if you, it's not anywhere near majority of what's actually visiting um, these plants. And then in 2023, I collected a much greater diversity, um, likely because of that nice lush uh, rain and vegetative growth and lots of um, ample habitat establishment. But Holtus Confucius was still the main pollinator, 29% uh, of my collection. That would be this section here. Uh, Helictus legatus is another helicted bee um, that comprised a small portion, but still an important portion of this collection. Bombus and Patients is the bumblebee, which is 13%, and that would be these big bees right here. Um, and then Apis mellifera in this graph is this red slice, which was only 3% of my collection. So a uh, pretty similar narrative here to show that maybe honeybees are not uh, as important as strawberries as we have previously thought they were. Um, I'd also like to point out that something I didn't mention, but we didn't find interrow cover or date to be significant factors for determining density or diversity of pollinators. Um, you can likely do a longer study. Heather Grab has done some really nice work on this. And, and you go into about five years or more, you start to see some more significant relationships with date. Um, but on the short term of a study, we didn't really see any uh, significant differences between those covers or date. So I want to go through marketable yields by cover. So these graphs are organized similarly to the other ones, except these are the four propagule types. And the cover here, bare ground is red, exclusion netting is green, and blue is the flowering cover. And uh, the mass here is on the side. And the story here is pretty clear. Um, exclusion performed significantly better than all of the other types, except for in control. It was a little bit lower. Um, but the exclusion cover really seems to yield a great amount of marketable fruit. Uh, this is likely due to some pest protective qualities. Um, also, some weather. You don't have dropping rain, which could just um, spread disease. And um, you also can have a small microclimate protecting from really intense sun or um, providing a sort of warming climate for fruit to develop. Um, also, flowering cover, while it seems like a really nice idea for pollinators, can be a huge uh, host plant selection for pests. Um, so while flowering cover may seem like a good idea, you actually might just be creating a really nice hotel for all of your worst nightmare pests to live right next to your crop. So um, we had to have a lot of tarnished plant bug intervention in addition to some other pests that we were experiencing, um, likely because there was such close availability of native flowers that they could host on. And then this is 2023 uh, marketable yield. The marketable yields are much lower um, really because of the precipitation, but the relationship is still mostly clear, especially in the plug plants in exclusion. 
Um, and this is likely because it had protective effects against the rain dropping onto the plants and onto the fruit. Uh, we also had an anthracnose breakout at the end of the season because of the sheer amount of precipitation. Um, so these exclusion covers, while they still were impacted by this anthracnose break breakout, still were yielding um, significantly more marketable fruit. Okay. I also developed a Akeem fertilization counting method for fruit sets. So typically people count Akeems in a few different ways. You can do um, a kind of quarter section, count however many fertilized Akeems you have, and then multiply that to estimate a percentage of fruit set. However, that's um, really time consuming, really challenging because these Akeems are really small. And if you have clusters of unfertilized Akeems like right here that are impossibly small and not at all separated, it can be really challenging to get a good estimate on what percentage you have fertilized when you can't get a, a good count on the total number of Akeems you have anyway. So what I wanted to look at, we took our exclusion tunnels and because these are not fully airtight, we were harvesting, lifting covers when we were harvesting. I had help of interns and not everybody closes the tunnels the same way. We were still having some insect activity. So to mitigate that, I exclusion bagged unopened inflorescences to ensure that there was no insect activity on the flowers and that they were fully self-pollinating. And um, this is usually what harvested fruit would look like. And then I would take these fruits that were considered marketable, cut the skins off, put them through a food processor, and then uh, we density sorted these akeens. So fertilized akeens are more dense, and so they will sink to the bottom. Unfertilized akeens are much smaller and less dense because they have no developing embryo. So they'll float. So um, we did individual fruits from a variety of different propules within the exclusion covers and manually counted all of these to come up with some fertilization proportions to show what was needed to have a really nicely fruit uh, set fruit. So here's the proportions from 2022 and uh, 2023 here. Um, what I would like to point out first is that that top method is very time consuming and you can only do one fruit in about 30 minutes with two people. So it's not super labor efficient. So our sample sizes in 2022 were pretty small. Um, I increased the sample sizes in 2023, but still um, it was pretty small, maybe like five fruits for each thing throughout the entire season. So it may be interesting to have a lot more um, labor to look at this and have a lot more fruit harvested and you could have maybe nicer relationships to look at. But um, the self-pollinated bars are on the left and the insect pollinated, which would be the ones that were not in any sort of exclusion covering um, are on the right. And in most of these situations, um, the insect pollinated bars are significantly higher fruit set proportion than the self-pollinated, which is a really nice uh, result to show that pollinators are important for fruit set. However, um, you can see that you can still have a really nicely set marketable fruit at as low as 38% fertilization for Albion, which is pretty stark. Um, that's less than half percent or less than half of the total Akeem's fertilized will still make a marketable fruit and only marketable fruit were analyzed in these uh, uh, experiments. So Albion is really nice and flexible if maybe you don't have access to pollinators or a really nice habitat or you just want to do a lot of protective covering to protect your marketable yields. So uh, to discuss a few key findings, the exclusion cover yielded much more marketable fruit, but lower fertilization rates. This seems pretty paradoxical and confusing, but the way I like to think of it is that it's a sort of trade-off for the grower to look at, especially in Albion. If they're in an environment with high pest pressure, high precipitation, high disease pressure, Exclusion covering or low tunnels may be really nice to protect their crop and reduce maybe chemical inputs. And Albion is still capable of self-producing a really nice set fruit. However, if you had maybe access to a really nice um, amount of IPM and labor and um, management of a lot of these different challenges, and you didn't want to have the exclusion tunnels up all of the time, uh, insect pollination 
will most definitely increase your fruit set and also likely your marketable yield percentages. So I think it's a, a decision up to the grower for what they can handle in their operation. Uh, total marketable yields were highest in plants with established vegetative growth and limited pest pressure. So these were often plug or early start plants in exclusion netting. Um, and this, I think, likely is because there was plenty of leaves available to photosynthesize and also um, enough root establishment so that during the season, they had um, enough resources to produce really nice looking fruit instead of having to compete between root, uh, leaf, and fruit development all at the same time earlier in the season. And whether particularly precipitation can have a very large impact on marketable yields. Like I said, 38% of the 2022 picking season, which was from the beginning of June to the end of October, and 57% uh, of the 2023 season, which was from the end, beginning of July to the end of September, um, was impacted by rainy days. And some conclusions. While protective barriers can protect plants and allow for greater yields, insect pollination is still significant for good quality fruit pollination. And as I mentioned earlier, pollinators did not move from the flowering cover onto the strawberries um, and pest pressure increased with the flowering cover, both of which of these um, often resulted in lower marketable yields. And uh, honeybees or Apis mellifera are not the main pollinator of strawberry in New York, specifically in East Ithaca, but rather there is a native guild of bees with Helictus confusus and Lasioglossum species comprising the majority of the pollinators in our East Ithaca site. So I'd just like to thank some people that uh, this would not at all have been possible without. First of all, um, Marvin for being a wonderful advisor and helping me dream up this project. Um, Greg Loeb and Heather Grab for being wonderful entomologist advisors and um, helpers in identifying all of my bees. Casper for doing basically uh, all technical aspects of managing and producing strawberries, which are a very labor intense crop to grow. Um, Erica from the Stats Consist Consulting Unit, who helped me analyze a lot of my data and make these really nice graphs that I was able to show you. And then uh, the Cornell Orchard interns from 2022 and 2023. Um, strawberries require a lot of labor, and without them, I would not at all have been able to do any of this work or collect these samples. So with that, I just want to thank you, and I'll take any questions you have. Do you have any questions? Yeah. In any sense how the pollinator guild changes throughout New York State? Um, so I think in the Intom department, they're doing a survey of what bees are present in New York State in general. Um, that may have just been completed. I also know Heather for her PhD did this kind of strawberry pollinator work at multiple sites in New York State. And so it may be interesting to look at what she collected, but she was observing Helictus confusus as the main strawberry pollinator and Lasioglossum kind of in the same cycles that I did. Um, though she did, I think her study was over five years at multiple sites, so she has a little bit more complicated of a guild story. But I think um, the seasonality of those bees is pretty set biologically. And so if those bees are present in that environment, it's likely they will cycle through in that way, if that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, Hannah. I don't really know anything about insects, so maybe this doesn't make sense. But I think it's possible that um, all the weather in 2023 like affected uh, some of the diversity breakdowns that you saw, because it's like if there were only so many nice like good pollinating days or something like you're gonna have everyone out there definitely you know, like people don't have that yeah days. that's definitely likely like there would be increased foraging pressure on specific days um i would hand wave and say that's likely um i, I have no da data to back I'm that sure. up but from having to collect on very specific days um yeah it, there was a, a good amount of activity on those days compared to the previous year where it seemed they were a little more flexible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I also don't think that 
species, but with the species that you observed, are any of the pigeons like content? Um, not that I know of. They're mostly solitary and um, keep to themselves when they're foraging. It's not uh, common for bees to be really aggressive when they're foraging unless like one accidentally lands on top of the other and kind of spooks them. Um, so I wasn't really aware of any antagonistic relationships during foraging or nesting. Um, there is one bee that I did not collect that Heather collected called um, the genus is Phacoides, and it's a parasitoid. And so that's obviously an antagonistic relationship where it's a parasitoid of other bees. Um, but the ones that I observed, I don't think any have antagonistic relationships. I wanted to speculate a little bit on, on the row cover. So you used one type of row cover yes. and it was down pretty much the whole time. Yes. Um, if you could speculate, could you uh, maybe design an additional modification to that row cover or think of a management system that might allow yeah. for better pollination but still give you some of the benefits of insect exclusion and maybe shielding that you're getting? Yeah. Um, if I were to design a sort of row cover implementation for this area, I would probably start with um, exclusion netting and like a plastic cover really early in the season and plant much earlier. So that way you have temperature protection and you've pushed your season up much earlier into the spring. And then as temperatures begin to warm up, you could change, take your plastic off and then you could do a uh, venting i guess for a few hours at peak times of the day um, maybe for three or four hours in the middle of the day on nice sunny days for pollination and then if you had rainy days or um, maybe you had been scouting and you saw a lot of pest pressure you could keep those down and um, protect your fruit from pests and then later in the season i know you've done some work with different coverings you could change your plastic for cold protection and also for um, increased uh, light quality um, in the later part of the season that could increase uh, the amount of photosynthates produced. And um, yeah, I think it would, it would have to be definitely labor dependent though, because you would need somebody to go and lift and change and do those sorts of things. So if you could, I think doing the peak hours of the day on a sunny day might be really nice in terms of labor. Um, instead of having to do multiple days or go out at strange times of day. Are the tarnished plant bugs diurnal or nocturnal or do we know? Um, I don't know uh, if the like cycle of their activity is known. I don't personally know, um, but I, I mean, I've seen, I saw a great amount of activity during the day um, with nymphs and females out um, it would be interesting to see if they were less active at night, um, but they seem to be active at the same times that pollinators are active. And so you have to start figuring out some trade-offs of how to manage tarnished plant, plant bug while also allowing your beneficials to do what they need to do to your fruit. Yeah, that was another really challenging thing with marketable yields was we were trying to pick a chemical intervention when the action threshold was surpassed to target the tarnished plant bug and also not pick really aggressive chemicals that could hurt bee populations because that could be felt weeks and weeks out if you harm it, harmed a nest or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, Eva? How do you determine if a barrier is marketable? Yeah, so the USDA has two different types of like marketable conditions, uh, number one and number two. They often are by weight, so they have to be at least five grams, fully red or 90% red. They can be a little pink, um, no physical deformation. So they have to be a typical like heart-shaped strawberry shape and they can't have any physical or damage. Uh, the sepals still have to be on. So there's like very clear marketability guidelines per the USDA for selling at certain grades. Um, so I was operating usually at the US number two line, which was a little bit smaller fruit. And um, I think they allow for 70% red so that we could pick a little bit earlier. Um, yeah, but that, that was the criteria that I used. I ask if Geneva has any questions. Yeah, uh, is there anybody on Zoom that has 
anything to say? I've got a question. Sure. Um, I don't know this, but do strawberry growers typically use hives in their field? Do they bring hives out? Um, it depends on the environment. I would say that if you had acres and acres and acres of strawberries and you were really, really needing pollination, people may bring out honeybees. Um, or you may be more inclined to just plant a more self-compatible variety so that you don't even need to worry about that. Um, Marvin, do you know, like in California, is it common to bring hives? I don't see too many hives. Okay. I know it's common, like blueberries, definitely um, some other hives that really need that activity or uh, acres or plantings that need that activity. But I don't know that in terms of small farms, right. it's... Uh, something that people commonly do. However, if you were a new berry grower or a new farmer and you weren't familiar about what people were doing and you have heard honeybees are great pollinators and they're in decline and I should do something about that, I'm gonna have hives, um, that could maybe persist a misconception that wouldn't be helpful and could be a cost that a grower does not need to pay for necessarily. Are there any other questions? Well, right. thank you. Thanks, This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.